from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. A few weeks ago, we made a public call for researchers, librarians, and technologists to share how they are applying the collections as data concept to their work. Each of these speakers will have five minutes throughout this session to talk about their projects. We will hear from Steven Weinberger, Chelsea Stieber, Kevin Schlotman, Ascension Mazuela Anguita, Ed Summers, Paul Farber, Jared Nielsen, and William Furster. Steven. Uh, I'm Steven Weinberger. Uh, I'm the director of linguistics at George Mason University. Um, I'm a phonologist by training, and um, I study speech accents. And we've put together a little speech accent uh, database at George Mason University. Um, so uh, how did this begin? Uh, began, began, how did this begin? In 1999, I gave an assignment to my um, phonetics class, and they're interested in teaching ESL. Uh, and so they went out and recorded non-native speakers and they used all sorts of magnetic tape and different kinds of tape recorders and we, we systematized it and put it on the web. And it's been on the web since 1999. In 2002 it was picked up and is now hosted by the uh, Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason. We want to thank them for keeping it up. Uh, what's the purpose of this archive? To demystify and to scientifically study speech accents, English accents by the way. Uh, and the database continues to expand. Uh, the corpus uh, has currently 20, uh, today it has 2399 samples, uh, 310 native language backgrounds from, native language backgrounds from ASL to Zulu. 175 countries are represented. There's 165,460 words at the moment. That's used by a variety of visitors like linguists, ESL teachers, engineers speech pathologists, actors, and most of the time, people doing drinking games. Uh, these are all the languages that are represented, uh, language backgrounds. Everyone is reading the same English paragraph. That's what makes the archive a bit unique. Uh, the architecture includes an elicitation paragraph, audio sample. Oh, I can look down here. Uh, uh, a dem some demographic information about each speaker. Uh, maps of the locations, phonemic tra phonetic transcriptions, which I'll show you an example of in a moment, uh, phonological speech patterns, like what makes a German speaker different from a, a Zulu speaker of English, segment inventories of each of the native languages, and it also has the uh, uh, opportunity for remote researchers to send in accents from all over the world. Um, and it has a search facility. There's 69 words in the elicitation paragraph. It's the famous please call Stella paragraph. Famous to me, at least. Uh, that's the whole paragraph. Everyone reads it. Uh, we have a strict recording uh, protocol. It's CD quality, and we reduce it to MP3 128 uh, bits. And he, let's see if this will work for you. You can listen to some of these things. Everyone recognizes an accent as soon as they hear it. Tell me if you think this is a non-native. Please call Steve. Can we turn it up a little bit? I'll do it again. Please call Steve. Please call Stella. Can you hear all that? Please call Stella. Anyway, those are three non-natives. Can you guess the languages? No. Uh, the first one's Amharic, the second one is Mandarin Chinese, and the third one is Russian. Um, you can listen to them on your own at another point on the archive. Uh, the speaker demographics come like this. Um, we, have, we ask them their native language. Of course, there are 310 of them at the moment. Uh, it's linked to an ethnologue code. We, have, uh, we ask what other languages they know. Residency includes data, uh, place of birth, English language residence, length of English residency, the gender of the individual, the age of the individual, uh, the English onset age, and the learning style. Everyone's asked the same seven questions. So this is, uh, this is all searchable information. And there's uh, room for some notes. Here is the paragraph transcribed with our funny phonetic alphabet that linguists use. I don't know if you'll be able to hear this. Let's see. This is a... Uh... Please call Stella. Ask her to print these things with her from the store. Six spoons are of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack for her brother Bob. We also need a small plastic 
So you can listen to all that. And I'm sure you were able to follow along with the uh, phonetics that we wrote there for you. Um, the phonetic inventories that are included uh, in the archive for each of the languages, at, at least 210 of them, are, are given in some form like this. They're all uniform, and you can compare Vietnamese to English and find out why a Vietnamese speaker is doing what she's doing when she speaks English, or why uh, um, a German speaker does what she does when she speaks English. Um, and the search facility looks something like this. You can do uh, pointed searches on all the data on the archive. So for research, the data is freely available. It has a uniform... Uh, uh, it's, it's uniform so that you can use, uh, use it uh, uh, to compare one accent to another, because everyone's reading the same thing. Uh, it's, um, it's turning into a massive database, so a lot of speech engineers are asking for, for it to use to train their machines to understand speech. Um, and we are now understanding with the archive a little better what it means to have an accent, uh, what it means to scientifically study an accent, and what affects an accent. Some of the most uh, crucial uh, factors involved in accent are listed right there, Na what your native language is, when you began to learn English or study English, your length of residence and where, and your learning style. And, it all, and uh, uh, it's, it's quite useful. Thank you. I think I made it within five minutes. My name is Chelsea Stieber, and I'm going to be talking you, to you today about Caribbean periodicals. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm a Kluge Fellow at the Kluge Center here at the Library of Congress, and in my other life, I am a professor at the Catholic University of America, assistant professor in French and Francophone studies. So, yes, I'm going to be talking to you about periodicals and the catalog, more specifically about a project I'm developing here uh, with a group of scholars on a specific uh, Haitian periodical, the Journal uh, of the Haitian Society of history, geography, and geology. So every good digital humanities project has a problem and a solution. Uh, so I'll present those here in the short time I have. Um, so this journal is Haiti's most significant social science journal uh, of the 20th century. It's actually still around. It was founded in 1923. Um, it's, that's almost 100 years of scholarship. Over 250 issues. Um, it's the most important repository of locally produced knowledge um, and of academic and social science research coming out of Haiti. And yet, and here's the problem, U.S. and really North American and North Atlantic academics don't cite it. They don't use it. It's really rarely used and read, and it's not part of sort of our academic um, uh, discourse. Um, and so the question is, why? Uh, and there are a lot of reasons why uh, that I certainly don't have the time to get into here and that would take us hours and hours to discuss. But there is one really interesting reason why, and it's something I discovered while doing my research here at the library. And that is specifically how periodicals exist in the library space and in the library catalog. Um, periodicals, when they come into the library, they are cataloged, but they are not indexed. So here I have a, a reproduction of the catalog entry for this social science journal. And here we have you know, a representation of 100 years of scholarship, local Caribbean knowledge production that is effectively illegible in the catalog. That is, we have our subject heading, Haiti periodicals, and actually the title itself is quite explanatory, but beyond that, we don't know what's inside. Um, and this isn't an indictment of the library catalog. This is precisely how the catalog is supposed to work, but the problem is that we don't get to know what's inside because it's not indexed. And I think this is specifically important for the Caribbean um, and the Global South more broadly because periodicals like this, uh, the, this journal, this is where knowledge production is happening in the 20th century. It's the privileged medium for Caribbean academic research, for local knowledge production, and for scholarship. And with this content being uh, virtually illegible um, to our searching, um, it's no wonder that people aren't using it or citing it. So, with that in mind, we decided to try and come up with a project to solve that. So what we're trying to do is expand access to this journal uh, and the impact of this scholarship, this 100 years of scholarship that the library holds. And in fact, the library is one of the few that has a nearly full run of this journal. Um, and so we really wanted to highlight it and get people citing it, get people using it in academic research. So uh, we finished phase one of our project, which is to create a database. 
So we, this, this team, uh, we've uh, basically indexed every issue uh, of the journal, um, subject headings and so on and so forth, and so now we have our database. Um, and the next step of the project is to develop a scholarly and collaborative space um, for people to access the content in searchable form and engage with the scholarship. And here I just wanted to uh, sort of shout out and cite um, uh, some people who are doing really best practices in Caribbean digital scholarship, and that is the folks at uh, Small Axe Archipelagos. Um, and I just want to read from their website. And if you haven't heard of them, check them out. They are great. Um, how might we encourage collaboration with, increase accessibility for, and otherwise work to narrow the gap between Caribbean researchers, especially those in the North Atlantic Academy, and the communities we are committed to serving? And so as we move forward into phase two, building this collaborative space, uh, which will be a site uh, with labs.loc.gov, um, we wanted to take this idea as sort of our driving uh, focus or inspiration, um, which is going to take sort of uh, the desire to reactivate this library holding, um, this rich holding in the library collection, and make it available to researchers, not just in this North Atlantic space, but also in the Caribbean as well. So we're envisioning um, annotations, translations, um, thematic groupings of content, um, creating a dynamic, vibrant space that will uh, improve access and impact to this Caribbean periodical. Um, again, this is in the works. Uh, it's, it's still in development now, and so I would love to hear from you if you have questions, ideas, advice, thoughts. Um, this already uh, conference today has been so illuminating uh, for that reason for me. So please, I'll be here after the conference, but also for those of you virtually who are uh, tuning in to the live stream, please tweet at me uh, and be in touch. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Schlotman. I am the Digital Archives Manager at the New York Philharmonic. And today I'm going to talk about, in my five minutes here, the uh, New York Philharmonic Subscribers Project. Uh, it was a project that we did in conjunction with a group of sociologists whose names and affiliations you see up here with support from uh, the Mellon Foundation. You can tweet us at NIFIL Archive, and today's hashtag is AsData. Before I go into the project, I just very briefly want to talk about the mass digitization that we are doing. Uh, since 2008, we've been supported by the Leon Levy Foundation to the tune of $5 million to digitize every last scrap of paper in our archives. Our archives go back to 1842 um, and document the oldest orchestra in North America and one of the three oldest in the world. Uh, we have extremely rich and deep archives in a variety of formats, including music. Um, we not only have scores and parts that are interesting in their own right, um, but they are marked by the conductors who have led the New York Philharmonic and the musicians who have played in the New York Philharmonic for the last 175 years. So these provide a tremendous insight into the development of orchestral performance practice. Uh, we have a complete set of programs going back to 1842, uh, we, from which we've also extracted data, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Uh, photos, of course, uh, 10,000 uh, folders of business records or archives, ranging from uh, minutes, uh, posters, correspondence, down to ephemera, things like uh, receipts and that sort of thing. Um, as well as 70,000 pages of press clippings uh, dating back to the very early 20th century. Um, essentially every mention of the New York Philharmonic in the American press, um, both national and local, as well as a lot of international press as well. So the subscribers project. Uh, we have uh, information relating to our subscribers, so people who bought more than one ticket or people who bought tickets to a series um, dating all the way back to 1842. And we have, we know their names, we know their addresses, we know what seats they bought, we know for how long they were engaged with the orchestra. Um, a couple of years after we launched the digital archives, the group of sociologists approached us and asked, uh, can we do something with this, with this subscriber data? We have some thoughts. And since it, was, it had been digitized, it was relatively easy. And I say relatively because underscoring a point that many people have made today, there's a lot of human labor that goes into extracting data from these things. But it was relatively easy to take the digitized 19th century books that you see here on the right um, and turn it into uh, a nice data, a JSON data set. Um, they originally were going to look at uh, trying to correlate uh, social status using address as a proxy with where people were actually sitting in the hall. They ended up going a slightly different direction, but that was their initial impetus. 
Um, in the, and then when they were done, they gave the data to us, and we have this nice little web widget uh, where people can search a select uh, portion of the data. And also the entire subscriber data set is available as a CSV download uh, from our website. It's anonymized post-1951 to um, protect the more recent folks, but all the data is there for anybody who wants to use it. Um, so what did the sociologists actually find? Well, when they got into the data, um, they, they dug in and they uh, gave us a more nuanced understanding of the nature of 19th century um, social status. Um, I think this is really interesting because they used the data to, um, you know, we know the kind of the big picture of gilded era um, social consolidation, but they used uh, the data to find something that they called segregated inclusion, which I'm going to read it, I apologize, is a form of inclusion that preserved the purity and distinctiveness of the social elite by allowing the non-elite cultural experts access to the concert hall, but in a limited way that reified the high class status of the orchestra and its subscribers. So that's a really nice, uh, a, a nuanced uh, twist on our understanding of how 19th century um, social conglomeration worked uh, in New York. It's a wonderful paper. It's coming out uh, next year in a leading sociology journal. Um, and not only did they use our uh, subscriber database, they also used our uh, performance database. So we have uh, data for every performance going back to 1842, uh, where it was, where it happened, when it happened, uh, what the repertoire was, who the conductor was, who the soloists were, whether it was an encore. And all of that data is available both on our website at uh, the performance history, as well as a downloadable data set in XML and JSON on GitHub that I update on a monthly basis. So you can look up our entire performance repertoire um, pretty much up to date whenever you want. Um, all of our archives are uh, available for free at archives.nifil.org. Um, go check it out. And in my last 30 seconds, I'd just like to say uh, thank you to the sociologists for approaching us and doing this work. Uh, thanks to LC for hosting us all here today. Um, thanks to my colleagues in the archives, especially Barbara Hawes, who has been the archivist and historian at the Philharmonic for many years and is really uh, the, the driver behind this digitization project. And to the Leon Levy Foundation, who have been kind enough to fund us for all of this digitization. Thank you. Astencio Mazuela, and I am glad to be here. Alan Lomax recorded hundreds of songs in Spain between June, 1950, June 1952 and January 1953. The material resource of his journey include music or magnetic tape, but also photographs, notebooks, invoices, letters and diaries preserved at the American Folklife Center of the Library of Congress. The aim of my research is to analyze the documents in order to establish connections between the songs recorded by Lomax in Spain and other collections of Spanish traditional music, such as that preserved at the Spanish National Research Council in Barcelona. Although it includes some music recordings, the Barcelona collection is primarily made up of more 20,000 false songs copied on paper and collected throughout Spain between 1944 and 1960, most of them through the so-called folkloric missions and competitions commissioned by the former Spanish Institute of Musicology. Since the materials at the Library of Congress and those in Barcelona were collected around the same time, often in the same villages and even using the same performers, it is clear that the collections complement one another, but to what extent is as yet unknown. The Barcelona collection is being digitized and catalogued in an open access database into which they have incorporated the details provided by the Lomas collection. Cataloging information on all the songs and people recorded by Lomax in Spain, including his photographs and links to audio files. I have also cataloged and transcribed documents, such as notebooks, letters and diaries, connecting them to the music, people and locations to which they refer, and including links to the corresponding digitization on the Library of Congress website. This stage has prepared the collection for analysis and comparison, and it is possible to identify concordances between this collection at the Library of Congress and that in Barcelona as regards locations, informants, musical genres, and songs. The Barcelona collection includes, for instance, several songs 
performed by this woman from a small Castilian village in the form of transcriptions made by the Spanish ethnomusicologist Manuel García Matos in 1951. A year later, Lomax recorded 20 songs performed by the same woman in the same place, and some of them coincide with those transcribed by García Matos, as in this example. Uno y dos y tres y dos. Como quieres que tenga, quieres que traiga el pelo a la cintura si no me alcanza el pajarito y el pajarero a vaca que bien cantará en el mes de enero. In a second stage, I am using the database as a research tool for interpreting data and preparing a monograph on the meaning of these concordances and on Lomax contact network in Spain in order to assess how this network determined his itinerary there and the music and people he chose to record. This digital tool also makes data accessible to other researchers. At the same time, through the database and the social networks to which it is connected, Lomas' contribution to Spanish traditional music can be better known and appreciated by a general audience. In order to provide a different approach both to the database and to the Lomax Spanish collection, I am creating a story map which presents Lomax's itinerary across Spain, connecting each town to an example of the music recorded there, to a related image belonging to the Lomax collection, and to a link to the complete information concerning that location on the database. The main purpose of this application is to make data more visual, not only to researchers, but also to a broader audience outside the academic context. Thus, as a researcher, I have benefited from making this collection available as data, as I am now able to analyze, compare and interpret information in order to produce academic publications. At the same time, the accessibility of the collection in an audiovisual Easily searchable and interactive way through the database and the map application allows descendants of the performers, school teachers, and the community in general to use and enjoy this magnificent collection, increasing its sociological impact. Thank you. Uh, this is a picture of um, a bunch of numbers. Um, <laughs> I guess it's a joke. Um, uh, but imagine this is a file, right? And, uh, and what I'm hoping to do in the next five minutes is convince you that this is a collection of data. And not only that, but that it's a useful collection of data. So um, I work on a project called Documenting the Now, um, which is a, a Mellon-funded project to uh, help build um, social media archiving tools and practices. Um, and with a particular focus on Twitter, which is kind of a, a third rail type of topic here. But, uh, um, and so I thought I would, uh, and actually my collaborator that I work with, Burgess Jules, um, spoke at this event last year, and maybe, maybe some of you remember his talk. He, um, this is one slide that he, he had, uh, that he showed, and um, uh, Burgess, uh, when, he, when he was here, was really trying to impress on everyone uh, the importance of doing social media archiving in the context of large state and corporate actors that are also doing social media archiving for the purposes of uh, surveillance and control, right? And so, you know, our project is interested in, in memory, right? So we're like remembering social media for the purposes of cultural memory. But, uh, but at the same time, we have actors like Geofedia who are sort of building social media collections that they are then advertising to a police department in California that they can help uh, the police department sort of manage the Ferguson situation, right? So, and um, so the challenge that we've been sort of working on is like, well, how do we do social media archiving in, while, while this is going on? How do we do it? in an ethical way that sort of respects the, the, the voices and, and the, uh, the content of the people that are creating the content, right? Um, uh, 
that that's kind of the challenge that we've we've had. And so um, there's no silver bullet here. There's no technical solution that's really going to do this for us. But we found that one one little um, uh, silver lining that we found is actually in Twitter's terms of service itself. Uh, they actually don't um, allow uh, people. So you have to agree to the terms of service to to get data from Twitter, and um, and one of the rules that they have is that you can't download data and then just sort of put it on the web, right? You can't uh, download millions of, of tweets and then sort of put them in Internet Archive. Because, they, I mean, for them, it's a, sort of a business decision, right? They, they have reasons why they don't want that to happen. But, but one of the interesting things that they do let you do is take a file of tweet IDs. So each tweet has a, a numeric identifier that identifies it. And they do allow you to distribute those, and um, you know, and that, what what you can do with a tweet identifier then is go, then go back to Twitter's API and get the data for that tweet. Um, and the interesting thing, thing that happens there is that if the tweet has been deleted or if the user has decided to protect their account or delete their account, you can no longer get that tweet. So it kind of empowers the user. It gives them some lever of control over how their content is used elsewhere on the web. Um, so which leads me to one. I, I, I should have said at the beginning, I'm going to talk about two applications if I don't run out of time. But uh, uh, this is the first application that I was going to uh, mention. It's called the catalog. And really, all the catalog is, is <laughs> I mean, really, it's just a web page uh, that lists. Uh, data sets of tweet IDs that different researchers have created for different purposes and sort of put them in one place so that other researchers can find them. And uh, so they have a description of the data set, who created it, uh, how many tweets are in it, what date range, um, that kind of stuff, uh, why they created it. And, uh, and then a link to go to a repository that's somewhere else on the web, right? So this is just a clearinghouse for the data sets that live elsewhere. Um, and uh, they can download it. And so once you download it, you end up with something like this, right? A file with a bunch of numbers in it. And, um, and so the other application I thought I'd mention really quick is the, the, the Hydrator application, which basically will, it's a desktop application that you download and run on your own workstation. It will read a, a, a data set of file, a data set of tweet IDs, and do what they call uh, hydrate them. So turn them back into the data that, um, that is useful for research. Um, and um, one of the other things it does is it will convert the, the Twitter JSON data to CSV it, once it's finished downloading. We heard a little bit about CSV earlier from Tahir. It's like a, a format that's used a lot in all kinds of uh, analysis. So actually, that's, that's really the majority of what I wanted to talk about. So um, I see that my time is up. So. Uh, these are a few URLs if you're curious. Um, the top one has links to everything else, uh, the two applications I talked about. So thanks for your time. Good afternoon. I'm Paul Farber. I'm the artistic uh, director of Monument Lab, a public art and history project based in Philadelphia. Thank you to Library of Congress for hosting us all today. In my day job, I'm a historian and curator, and I represent and lead a collective of scholars, curators, artists, and students um, around this project since 2014. And we're interested in building temporary monuments in public spaces and data sets that endure in libraries, and online as open data. We're gearing up for a big fall 2017 citywide exhibition in Philadelphia with the Mural Arts program. Our project centers around a question. What is an appropriate monument for the current city of Philadelphia? We have a city full of public art and statues, murals, but sometimes, we need assistance to fill in what is there. So this project is one where we use this question to invite people in. 
We ask artists to build temporary monuments, and we ask this to the public as a way to measure both the expected or the municipal, and also understand the possible, the dreamed, the speculative, the haunts of the city, to have a more complete vision of our historical landscape. We're working with 20 artists from around the world and around Philadelphia who are going to be building these monuments in public spaces. Some will use the kind of traditional formats, bronze, granite, but others are going to build their monuments with sound, light, performance, interactivity. Many of these artists take on issues of social justice, especially around race, gender, sexuality, class, national belonging, to make sure that our monumental landscape represents a city founded on freedom, justice, and toleration. Their works will be cited around the city of Philadelphia and our five central squares that go back to the 1680s, and five neighborhood parks. At each of these sites, there's at least one temporary monument and a learning lab where we use this research form. On this form, we ask the public to name their monuments, place it somewhere in the city, an address, an intersection, a neighborhood, though that often is broken, you'll see in a moment. We also ask them in a big open space to describe or sketch. In addition, if people want to leave their home zip code, their age, their social media handle, that they can add that on as well. This is not the first time that we've done this. Back in 2015, in the courtyard of City Hall, we had our discovery phase thanks to the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage. Here, our temporary monument by the late Terry Adkins was an empty classroom to comment on educational pride that we have in the city and also the fact of budget cuts and school closures that marked our current civic landscape. In addition to this classroom, we had the different kind of classroom, the learning lab, where teams mostly of, of youth researchers from college and high school would gather public proposals. In the three and a half weeks that we were in the city hall courtyard, um, we had 455 people leave monument proposals. We had 4,000 people come to free programs every day, and over 30,000 people visit the monument. When you see these pieces here, this comprises an imagination of the city. And on one hand, each piece matters, and the data set as a whole both stand out. For each piece, it can be seen in the lab itself, at a museum or gallery, and is deposited in a local library. Some snapshots here. Dancing with love in your step, right in the heart of the city. Door to door, an imaginative portal between neighborhoods. In the city of brotherly love, I don't love you, but I. Of course, there's poignant and important forms of truth-telling. Someone who's wary of the murder crisis in our city called attention to the shrines around the city at sites of violence. Others were more poetic, blurring the boundary between a vision of a statue or just an exchange between Philadelphians. And then, of course, the complex. Like Klaus Oldenburg said, proposing monuments is like composing with a city. In addition to the individuals, you can see the data set. You can see it on a map across the city. We've also transcribed and analyzed and uh, done an initial level of classification that is on Open Data Philly, the portal for civic data in the city. So alongside crime statistics and um, traffic incidents, this data set that is powered by speculation by cultural memory is available. Ultimately, our goal is to change the way that we write the history of our city together. 
and we take up the call for cultural uh, heritage organizations to find new ways to bring in voices, people, and data, not just to pow be powered by imagination, but also to co-author the next chapters of our city's history. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jared Nielsen. I'm an artist and instructor at George Washington University where I teach full stack web development. I recently discovered the digital collections available to the public on LC's website. If you haven't discovered it yourself, I highly recommend browsing this. You'll lose hours of your day. Uh, it's a fantastic collection. Um, there's one collection in particular that caught my eye. And it was this Pictorial St. Louis. It's a series of plates that were published as an atlas in 1875 by the artist Camille Dry. Um, this was created at this time as an you know, act of boosterism by the city when they were making a bid to become the nation's capital because they thought their position on the Mississippi being a massive trade economic route was more suitable for our nation's future than this current swamp. So these plates are incredibly detailed um, and beautiful. And one of the things I thought was really interesting when I found these is that there, there was no technology used in their creation. There's no airplane, there's no hot air balloon. This was all Camille Dry and his team beating the pavement, making these records, and then transposing their 2D data into a 3D aerial perspective representation. So there's a little more of the detail here. Um, so the atlas was published with a key that shows you where, which plates where they lined up with their geographic position in relation to St. Louis. Because these were all hand-drawn, some of the plates have these interesting features where a landmark is breaking the frame. And um, I wanted to keep this when I, well, first, let me just say, when I discovered this, I wanted to do something with this. If we step back to the key, I wanted to see all the plates stitched together as one large map. And this is one of the issues I encountered, though, is when stitching these together, there are a lot of these breaks with the frame. So I cleaned up all of these, but I left these, these landmark details and inserted some space into the map. And I, I had to convert it to grayscale because this became such a massive um, image file that the only way for me to pull this off was to strip out all the color data and go grayscale. So this is the, a, a small version of the final um, image, which if anyone here works with digital images, you know that an image that's 64,000 by 20,000 pixels is a monster. So this was, uh, its size is roughly like 900 megabytes. So that's huge. It was kind of like crippling my workstation. Like my GPU is really struggling to keep up with this. So I have a background in exhibit design and museums also. And in a couple exhibits I've worked on, we've used open frameworks and processing to do, to handle you know, interactive images. And I tried running that, I tried running this through those programs, and it was just killing them. And I wasn't sure what to do, so I asked myself, well, my, my goal is to keep this interactive in a way where the, the detail wouldn't be lost, but we could also still have this like, pulled out global scope. So I thought, well, how does Google Maps work? So I Googled it. How does Google Maps work? And I found this, this great framework, Leaflet. It's an open source JavaScript library that um, has really great, robust tutorials. And it's very, very easy and simple to implement. And then through a little more Google Foo, I found these fantastic repos on GitHub that helped me piece together this non-geographic story map. So Leaflet is intended specifically for you know, geographic maps, for geospatial data abstraction layers. And I was kind of perverting it by using these non-geographical, these raster images. So I found 
this one here, raster chords, that was key in being able to pull this off. This is maybe like the least dynamic slide that I have, but maybe the most important. Um, this is a directory structure. This is my file tree. When I, through Leaflet, I needed to um, splice that big image up into smaller tiles. So here you can see how the tiles are nested. This is like the levels. And these are all the thumbnails. And each of these is 256 pixels. So we've all had this experience when we're on a slow data connection and we're using Google Maps and we see the little squares pop up and then they slowly come into focus. That's map tiling in action. You're seeing map tiling happening. And this is what map tiling looks like on a server. So I'm going to step through these Zoom slides. And I want you to pay attention to this upper left-hand corner, because this is 0, 0 in our coordinates. We're going to zoom in on 0, 0. So my map had eight layers, and we just zoomed through eight layers. And my time is up, so I have to move really quickly. JavaScript is awesome. This is one of the reasons why. Um, you can really simply implement this map yourself, that's all it takes. I needed help, so I asked the librarian at the LC for some background information on Camille Dry and this map. If you haven't used the Ask a Librarian service, I highly recommend it. Within a week, I received several scanned PDFs that were highlighted, no less, of the pertinent information that I needed. I plugged it into a JSON file like this, and this is the, last, the final end result. If you want to see it in action, uh, you can do so at this URL. If you want the repo to build this yourself locally, go here. And you, I wrote a tutorial on Medium that you can find here. All right, thank you. My name is Bill Furster. I'm with uh, the University of Virginia at the, uh, at, at, uh, actually, it's hard to say. It's the Sciences, Humanities, Arts, and, and um, and humanities uh, technology initiative. It's kind of a, a little thing, but. So anyway, what I've come here today to show you is a tool called Visualize. And Visualize was, is a tool that was uh, designed uh, by us uh, for use in kind of two different areas. One was is for uh, teaching classes interactively in a project-based uh, setting, pretty much like, like uh, what you saw the uh, uh, the people doing the, the students uh, earlier in. And also we use it for, for making scholarly ar arguments using uh, historical data, using primary source historical data. So basically what it is, is we, 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 we've connected a, a timeline, um, a, um, uh, a, a story panel, and a, map, and a slippy map. Uh, all together and, and, and put, it, put it in so that you can actually make uh, things with it. And on top of that, uh, that map, you can, you can overlay things on top of it, and they're georeferenced, things like that. So you can have you know, dots or things on top of it. You can have interactive graphics. Uh, you can have uh, KML files, which are basically uh, vector overlays on top of it, or historic maps, and, and that becomes quite useful. So also, we've got a variety of other kinds of tools that you can use to make your presentation. So, so you can, this is a drawing tool built in, so you can draw things on it. Uh, and then you can do kind of pan and zoom maps and, and coreplus, which are a way of showing data uh, relationships uh, on top of maps. Um, this, this tool, basically, it's all web-based, and it, it's, uh, it's very easy to use. And the idea is, is instead of things like ArcGIS, which are, are very uh, robust tools for doing uh, geographic information system type work, uh, these are, are easily used by, by humanities scholars or by students. And the key to our, our way that we've set it up is we've tried to use a very distributed process. So. Uh, I came from, from uh, at UVA, we, we had a place called the Virginia Center for Digital History that, that Ed Ayers had started. And we used to use all databases back then, and, and uh, these very complex uh, MySQL databases. And, and what really came down is humanities scholars typically have a big table, for the most part. And it's, it's X number of, uh, of fields about the thing, and then a whole bunch of events. And so we'll, what we did is that, well, we don't need all that complicated uh, 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 database, Let, let's try and use a spreadsheet. And the advantage of using a spreadsheet is that Google has built in all this incredible sharing techniques within the spreadsheet. 
And so the, so the, and the spreadsheet is, is connected live to the visualization. Uh, they, they told me actually I couldn't use the, the internet, so I would have actually shown it live uh, here. But, but the idea is that you change one thing on the spreadsheet and, and it changes on, on the visualization. And it's also stored there, so people have more you know, autonomy with their, with their data. Um, and and for, for classroom use, it, it works out quite well. Um, anyway, so it was funded by the NEH, uh, which, uh, which funded us in, in a variety of different projects for the Digital Humanities Project. It's uh, free to use and uh, HTML-based and, and open source. And uh, anybody, anybody can just look on it. There's www.vizeyes.org. And that brings up a page which has a variety of different tools that we make at Shanti. And uh, if you need to get a hold of me, I'm there. So thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.